Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Backlog Paddle Podcast. This is Alex. And in case this is the first time you've ever tuned into our show, we talk to gamers from all walks of life, whether they're content creators, game developers, game designers, or even just regular gamers in the hopes of understanding our gaming community at large. This is not your typical gaming podcast, because the focus isn't just about the games. It's also the people behind the games you play, whether they're people who play them, or the people who make them, or maybe the people who you watch play these games. This is the very first video podcast that we're posting on the Backlog Battle podcast channel. You can't imagine how excited I am to actually start posting video podcasts. It's been a long time dream of mine, and by opening this brand new channel, I hope you gain a newfound appreciation of what we're trying to do in Backlog Battle, which is again, to discover and play together. For the first video that I'm posting on this channel, I am posting a different version of the interview that I have with Hironobu Sakaguchi. If you already subscribed to me on the Backlog Battle YouTube channel, then the reason why you'd want to watch this again is because this contains the raw translation that Mike from Miss Walker PR actually delivered while I was doing the interview. But when you subtitle things, sometimes the translator's translation, for the lack of a better term, can be longer than what the actual speaker is conveying, which is what led to me actually just subtitling here Nobu Sakaguchi on the other video. However, it comes with compromises, right? So for the first time ever, this is the full uncompromised translation that Mike actually did for us. And again, I have to thank Mike for his work during this because without him, this interview wouldn't have happened. With all that preamble out of the way, here is yet another perspective, another version of my interview with Hironobu Sakaguchi. Enjoy. First of all, I'd just like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview you today. I know you've been very busy working on Fantasian Part 2, but as a longtime fan, this opportunity has been a dream come true. So thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So let's start with an easy question. What is the significance behind Fantasian's name? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, Final Fantasy is what I'm most known for, and thanks to everyone, both in, in the industry and, and all the fans who have supported and helped it grow into something so, so major. Um, after I quit Square Enix, uh, I had tried to avoid using the word fantasy because I thought that's not what people wanted to hear from me, and uh, it was a conscious decision to kind of avoid that. But one of the sparks, if you will, of me creating Fantasian was when I played Final Fantasy VI with some of my old colleagues on a live stream broadcast, and it helped me kind of return to my roots and also made me wonder what if we had created an experience like this using a lot more modern tech which is available to us. And that idea combined with the thought that perhaps this may may very well be uh, my retirement. This may be the last game that, that I make before I retire. And it, even if that were the case, I think I would be okay with coming to terms to that. So I figured, you know what, what the heck, I can kind of go and lean into this idea of uh, using the word fantasy, which I had avoided all of these years and that, that it would be okay. So how did the idea of replaying Final Fantasy VI come about? A few years back, I think that this was released in uh, North America as well, which I confirmed, but the uh, there was a mini SNES that was released from Nintendo and it comes pre-installed with about 20 different uh, games of which in the Japanese version Final Fantasy VI was one of them. I'm not sure if uh, that was the same for the overseas or international versions, but at any rate, there was a publication called Famitsu, which you might be familiar with, yes. that had the idea for this anniversary of uh, SNES, mini SNES. Let's gather some of these old creators and have them play their classic games on the mini SNES. So they had planned this live broadcast and they had invited me and I thought to myself, well, you know, this could be kind of fun to reconnect with my old, old people and it, it this might be a cool experience to play this old game. So I had partook in this event, which which was how we got to playing Final Fantasy VI after all these years. What qualities of Final Fantasy VI strike you as something that you wanted to represent or revisit in Fantasian? 
There are certainly a few different elements of Final Fantasy VI that I think lended itself to, to Fantasia. The first one being the turn-based combat, which I believe involves a lot of thinking and kind of strategic elements that are heavily weighed in the battle encounters. Uh, another one is in Final Fantasies 1 through 6, there is a it's really based on this idea of a grid system and everywhere the characters can go is clearly defined by a grid so that really in a way to me enhances this idea of discovery and exploration and puzzle elements if you will for example in final fantasy 6 there could be a forest and off to the side there's a path that you can go down and once you go down that path you're rewarded with a treasure so the sense of discovery and kind of exploration i think take for example another one where you see a treasure chest behind the counter in a shop or the weaponsmith and you think to yourself, how do I get that? You explore, there's a side door, there's a back door, somewhere there's a way for you to get behind that counter. This kind of sense of tickling curiosity of, of the fans, I think is something that was unique to the old Final Fantasies. And I'd had fans or, or different players come up to me and say, oh, there was no treasure in Final Fantasy VI, I didn't find. Because there's an idea that because it is a grid, you can literally explore every single grid spot that there is to explore. So I think I wanted to try crafting that experience once more with, with Fantasia. Over the past several years, mobile game development has grown rapidly to allow niche genres to thrive. As a creator, what do you think about the mobile gaming landscape today? Oh, I think there's a, a quite significant difference between uh, Japan and the so-called the West in terms of how different mobile games and the industry has evolved. And in Japan, I think Asia especially, the gacha industry, the random loot boxes as you know them, <laughs> was really the major dominant player and game mechanic system at the time. And this is something that I've incorporated into my other game, Terra Battle, as well. And I think the thing that was really interesting about this, and I don't know how deep I can get into this without sounding like this is all uh, driven by money, but a lot of this users or this gotcha mechanics in terms of games were designed in a way to help encourage players spend money and I think it helped the game mechanics and these game systems evolve and game mechanics and use this sort of users demand or or desires have kind of converged in a weird way and these mechanics have become more and more complex going down this path and I think that you know they're very very well constructed in some of them and it was a very odd but interesting development in terms of the mobile game industry. Whereas now I feel with the introduction of platforms such as Apple Arcade, which of course doesn't feature any, any gotchas or, or microtransactions, we've kind of come back and have been able to bring these more normal apps that aren't so driven and aren't so pressured into becoming that type of game. And it's helped us discover different ways of not depending on the micro transactions, but still crafting uh, fun and, and interesting experiences. So in a odd turn of events, I think we've returned to almost the roots of what makes games very enjoyable, combined with this idea that because they're played on the phone or on these mobile platforms, communication is very seamless and very easy for different players to interact and, and build communities. So we're able to see many different types of games and interpretations of games because of what the platform has enabled us to, to be able to do. And again, the gacha went off in a very odd tangent, especially in Japan, whereas today I feel we've almost kind of come back and normalized where, where the industry should be. Was Apple involved at all with the development of the game? Creatively, Apple entrusted uh, full control to us and our team so in terms of developing the experience and what we wanted to do that was really uh, up to us however in terms of the more technical aspects they gave a lot of support because it being on apple arcade of course needs to run on the macs to ipads to 
iPhones and all kinds of different hardware in between. So the support system was really in place. And I think overall it's a very good environment in which to develop and craft these experiences that we were going for. Because of how games are made,、uh, some developers write their stories alongside the development process. Did you have to do this for Fantasian, or did you have to finalize the story first before making the game? At the very core of our development style, the story, the scenario, forms the base and a strong foundation before we really go heavy on the game development side. With that said, of course, some Scenario or story element tweaks will happen during development and even towards the latter portion of development, and there are various reasons for that. In the case of Fantasian, because we are using dioramas, we had, might have crafted a certain scenario or story beat, which we had then had to go back and change because the diorama artisans would tell us, "Hey, it'd be really hard to construct a town or a city this way." So I think we should shift it to. Be more like this, or perhaps one of the team members might say, "Hey, this character doesn't have that much screen time. Let's feature him or her a little bit more." So there are other, many reasons as to why we might kind of deviate from that. But as a general rule, the scenario is pretty well fleshed out before we tackle the game development. I love the characters so much that I would have loved to have heard these characters with voice acting.、Uh, was that ever considered at one point? Uh, me personally, I can fully understand and relate to what makes voiceover very attractive—a very attractive option as a form of expression. But early on, I had made the decision to not voiceover these characters, and I think there's a very unique flavor that you can get from a text-based only type of experience. And if you've played Fantasia, you might know that there are certain memories that are depicted through these novels. And these novel parts, I thought, would have a much more seamless transition with the game if we had not voiced anything. So, because of those reasons, I had. Early on, made the decision to not include voices in in Fantasia. What was it like collaborating with Oamatsu-san on Fantasia, especially knowing that this might be the last game you both will be working on? I think、uh, Uematsu-san is, of course, going to continue composing a few tracks here and there. Perhaps I don't want to be misquoted in saying that this is the the end of his career、uh, by any means. But in terms of composing or scoring a soundtrack from A to Z, an entire game, in this case Fantasia, there were 60 tracks that that he had scored and, and composed for us. I think that that will probably. Be his last, and what that did for me was to make sure Fantasia was a game worthy of that that weight in a way that、uh, you know we could handle and, and be the proper platform for Uematsu-san to exert that final、uh, energy. And this is something that Uematsu-san actually said seven to eight years ago. He said, you know, what would it be like if Final Fantasy VI? I think in Final Fantasy VI, when we really peaked and got that pixel art. Perfect. This grid-based RPG experience. I think that was, the, in the many ways, the most complete form. What if Final Fantasy VII didn't take a turn and become fully CG? Like, what would it look like? And this is something he had, he had mentioned. If we had continued pursuing and innovating and going down that path, what would this hypothetical Final Fantasy VII have looked like? And <laughs> He had joked sometimes about gathering all the members from Final Fantasy VI and making this hypothetical <laughs> Final Fantasy VII or six point five, if you want to call it that. And I had told Uematsu, "That's not possible. We can't. That's it's just not going to happen." But you know, it, the one of the concepts for Fantasia for me was returning to my roots of game development, and、uh, you know, knowing that this might very well be Uematsu's last. Soundtrack fully composed, and in fact, before Fantasia, he had already hinted that because of health reasons, he might not be able to continue composing and scoring for video games. So, knowing all of that, I wanted to really 
inherit that spirit that that Ian mentioned about taking Final Fantasy VI and really pursuing that innovation and that branch, I guess you could say, in game development history and seeing it through. So in many ways, perhaps Fantasia is uh, Final Fantasy 6.5. And because of that, I think Uematsu-san almost superimposed that or, or saw that this is almost inheriting that torch or, or kind of creating that Final Fantasy 6.5 that he had talked about many, many years ago. And I think because of that, he kind of overcame a lot of the health challenges and said, okay, you know what, I'll, I'll do it. I'll go from start to finish and, and compose this with you. Did you like my review of Fantasia? Uh, yes. I actually tweeted it earlier. Um, <laughs> And uh, thank you for saying that. I noticed you took a lot of that behind the scenes footage and integrated it into your video. So thank you. Thank you very much for making that. You're welcome. I, that's, it just shows how much I love the game. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. In one of the videos promoting Fantasia, Uematsu-san mentioned that he realized that he helped define what an RPG soundtrack would sound like. Do you feel similarly about your impact in the RPG genre? Oh. I don't think I would go so far as saying that I defined it. That's a little bit of a, that's quite an overstatement, actually. And even what we might call the so-called so JRPG genre, there are many types of RPGs and many interpretations and creators kind of bring their take on what that experience might look like. And for me, I just happened to fall into this Final Fantasy style of game. And that's something that I had wanted to make. So I would certainly not go so far as saying I define the genre as a whole. As a content creator, I sometimes find myself in situations where I don't feel motivated to make things. Uh, what do you do that keeps motivating you to create great stories and games? Beginning of any project, I certainly share that sentiment where I look at a upcoming task, what we have to do and think to myself, oh my gosh, this is going to be so much work and my motivation is really, really down. But when you actually sit down and start the process and you get the ball rolling, I think I my motivation gradually begins to increase. And part of that, I think, comes from... I somehow feel that I'm exploring this world with the characters. Like, as I write the scenario, as I'm writing these stories and, and their dialogue, I'm going on an adventure with these characters, which I know might sound like someone who's completely lost his marbles going off the deep end. It's like a crazy person. But diving into these imaginary worlds that I create with these characters, to me, is a really, really good sensation. And I think that's what keeps me motivated. If there's one piece of advice you can give your younger self, what would it be? You know, I think when I was much younger, there were many, many times where I was moving really fast. I had this sensation that there was just not enough time in the world. And I think I was hurrying and trying to reach for something. And I might have told myself to slow down, but on the second thought, maybe not. Maybe I wouldn't have told myself to slow down. I think there is a certain portion of that that could have only be done because I was really, really young. And maybe that ended up creating the kind of environment that it did and there was some good that came of it so what i probably wouldn't tell myself is to move faster hurry more which perhaps i think i was uh, already at, at the limit then so i might say you know why don't you enjoy yourself more or do some things that you like choose choose the path that you think suits yourself best perhaps i'll, I'll leave some words like that <laughs> okay <laughs> That's good, good advice. <laughs> Interviewing you is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for many. So I want to take a brief moment here to relay a message from one of my fans. And I'd also like to see if it's okay to ask you to reply to them directly. Oh, なるほど. Hi, hi. This is from Mikaya, the otaku gamer. It simply reads, Thank you. 
Your creative works have inspired me for my whole life and got me through the hardest of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so well thank you very much. Like, that's the type of comment that I think makes a person in my position the absolute happiest. And I know we can't want or seek that type of comments as we're creating something. We don't go into a project saying, oh, we're going to like change people's lives and inspire them. Uh, but in hindsight, after you've produced something and created something and sent it out into the world, hearing people feel that way or that we've affected their lives in, in such a way I think is, you know, it's really the happiest kind of moment for me as a, as a creator. What would you want your lasting legacy to be, not just in the gaming industry, but to the fans of your work? Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I would go so far as saying something like uh, legacy or what I want to impart on, on this industry, maybe not as, as grand as that, perhaps, but games at their core, I think, can exist with really only a system or if you call like a game mechanic if you have a strong mechanic you really don't need anything else and i think that's at the very core of any game or interactive type of experience so to take this media that only requires game mechanics at its core and add adding story to it and bringing the players on an emotional journey of course it will it will kind of implore me to put these more dramatic or even sad moments into the game, but in the end, I hope that I can impart a more kind of uplifting and heart heartwarming state or emotion onto these players, taking these games in which systems are at their core, trying to add something that perhaps doesn't necessarily sort of fit that media in, in a way that people used to think. I mean, it might be a very odd combination. You could say it's mixing water and oil but I've always tried to pursue this idea of taking games which inherently rely on the mechanics themselves and adding this sort of uplifting feeling to it and I hope that fans around the world and including fans of Fantasian can kind of take some of that with them and if that does happen that would definitely make me really really happy. Sakaguchi-san, it's been an honor and a privilege to chat with you today. And speaking personally, I can't wait for Fantasian Part 2. Uh, do you have any parting oh. words? <laughs> do you have any parting words you wish to say to your fans? As you mentioned, we're hard at work developing Part 2 of uh, Fantasian right now, but I think we've reached a point where I can begin to see the end of, of this particular development cycle. Uh, in, in other words, perhaps you could say uh, sometime in the next few months, I know, uh, you know, we won't have to keep the fans waiting too long, I hope. So very, very soon we'll, we'll be able to see how the story unfolds. But uh, after part two, actually, I've been considering another major update to the experience at some time in the future. So perhaps even after part two, when the experience is complete, there will be a little something extra for uh, longtime fans of, of Fantasia. So thank you, of course, very much for everyone's support and uh, stay tuned for more. Awesome. And that's that's really it. That's that's all, all right. the questions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi. Ijeon Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alex. I want to give special thanks to Mike, who handles the PR at Mistwalker. Mike also worked with me to make this interview happen, as well as serving as our translator. I also want to thank the many members of the community who responded to the post I mentioned earlier in this video. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this version because I really enjoyed making it. And remember, if you love these podcasts, be sure to subscribe because there will always be a brand new episode of the Backlog Battle podcast coming out every Wednesday at 12 a.m. Pacific time without fail. And if you want to experience all these podcasts probably weeks earlier, you can always become a patron at patreon.com slash backlog battle. We're going to be doing a lot of really cool things with the Patreon over the next few months to really make it like a fantastic place to really experience the different parts of backlog battle. 
I hope you enjoyed this version and that it provided you with a different perspective on the interview. And I'll see you next week for a brand new episode of the Backlog Battle Podcast with brand new guests and talented creators. 